Uh, uh, so maybe if I can uh, sort of kick off this session, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody uh, today. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, it's good that you could uh, make it today on uh, this, this this side event uh, dealing with uh, uh, sort of the, a new uh, data gaps initiative, which you know will have a greater focus on 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 a number of things, including the environment. Um, I'm Greg Peterson. I am from Statistics Canada, and it's my pleasure to be chairing this session today. Uh, just to kind of set a framework uh, or, or set the stage a little bit, um, you know, in the past couple of days, uh, Stephen Pollitz, the former governor of the Bank of Canada, uh, published a book where he talks about uh, tectonic shifts that are affecting economies, right? Uh, things like uh, technological change, age, aging population, increased debt, uh, income inequality, and, and climate change. Um, these issues, of, of course, aren't new to almost everybody in the room, but, but I really like the metaphor of tectonic shift. Uh, you know, the idea of uh, plates banging together, uh, creating earthquakes and volcanoes and, and other dramatic events. And, and I think if we take a look at climate change, uh, you know, uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, we are seeing change happen. If we think about the, uh, the droughts that have affected much of North America over the past year and uh, the resulting impact on, on uh, food prices, global food, food prices uh, on a range of different commodities. If we think about, uh, you know, more severe weather effects and, um, you know, how that has highlighted the importance of uh, climate adaptation and uh, the need for investment to, to make that happen. All of that kind of boils down to uh, kind of increased risks faced by uh, sort of economies and, and countries as, as we move forward. Uh, so it's, 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 it's not too surprising that um, uh, sort of in the, the idea of a new data gaps initiative that uh, we, we take a look at or we apply more of a climate lens to things. Uh, and I think uh, this session is, is appropriate uh, so that we can uh, sort of discuss uh, sort of how that climate lens uh, is, is, is applied and, and how we can use uh, sort of frameworks like SIA uh, to provide environmental data that's, that's fit for use to, to describe uh, sort of risk associated with these tectonic shifts. Um, this is a side event to uh, the, uh, the Statistical Commission meetings that will take place virtually from the 28th of February to the 2nd of, well, 20th of February to 2nd of March and March the 4th. Um, the, uh, in terms of logistics, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if you, if attendees want to ask a question during the Q and A period, uh, you can do so with the chat or you can, you can raise your hand, uh, and so that you can be unmuted and ask a question. Um, I should note that we're recording this, this event and it'll be posted on the UNSD YouTube account. Uh, so, uh, if, if you, if you want to share this to colleagues afterwards, um, uh, please, please do so. Uh, with that, I'd like to, uh, I guess, turn to kind of the main body of, of our, our session today. And to uh, set the scene, I, I would first like to turn to uh, Louis-Marc Ducharme, who is uh, the, the Director of the Statistics Division, uh, Chief Statistician and Chief Data Officer for the IMF. Louis-Marc. Many thanks, uh, Greg, for this uh, kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. And on behalf of the IMF, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, side event of the 53rd uh, session of the United Nations Statistical Commission. Uh, while the pandemic has still not allow us to meet in person, I think we will take the advantage of virtual format, which allow us to have a broader audience to this event. So welcome to all. I would like to thank the UN Committee of Experts on Environmental Economic Accounting and the UN Statistical Division for co-organizing this event with us. As some of you know, uh, phase two of the Data Gap Initiative closed in December of 2021, resulting on the availability of a comprehensive, standardized, and timely set of data for policymakers to understand the trends and risk in the global financial and economic system as they were identified during the 2007-2008 global financial crisis. But as Greg mentioned, the world continues to evolve, the economy is shifting, and we must look ahead to respond to the current and upcoming data needs for policymaking. The G20 finance minister and central bank governor recognize that improving data availability, including on environmental issues, is critical to better inform policy decision. And as a consequence, 
has asked the IMF to prepare in close cooperation with the Interagency Group on Economic and Financial Statistics and the Financial Stability Board, a concept note and a detailed work plan on the new data gap initiative. This side event today will present an overview of the new data gap initiative. The objective of this new data gap initiative is to address the most relevant policy needs and when possible, building on further and further developing the established statistical infrastructure while gathering the political support essential for successful implementation. Without political support, you cannot achieve anything. This effort should be carefully coordinated with other existing international statistics work stream. We want to avoid duplication and exploit possible synergy. The new DGI planned to be launched later this year will leverage on the success of the previous data gap initiative of phase one and phase two, which I alluded to, which were the result of a collaborative effort of participating economies and international organization with an effective peer pressure mechanism and support of the G20. And I insist on the peer pressure, which is really important. The draft work plan of the new DGI was prepared by the IMF in close collaboration with the IAG members and the FSB and includes input from representative of the Italian and Indonesian G20 presidency. It focused on four important topics. First, climate change. Second, household distribution of information. Third, fintech and the financial inclusion and for the access to private and administrative data and data sharing. The development of this work plan has resulted in 14 draft recommendations, of which seven focus on climate change related indicators. And you will not be surprised about that. The initiative version of the work plan draft by international agency benefited from the feedback received during several rounds of consultation with compiler and user to ensure a good balance between the data needs and the statistical capacity of countries. These consultations are still going as we speak. As a consequence, the progress made so far for the new data gap initiative is due to be sustained and is due to the sustained and dedicated effort and work undertaken by all participating economy and international agency. While the new data gap initiative is focused on the G20 and the non-G20 FSB member economy, it provides other economy an important incentive to develop climate change data and indicators directly related to their reality. I'm really looking forward to the presentation by Indonesia and Germany, which will shed light on how economy are addressing and planning to address data gaps and produce indicators to monitor the transition to a low carbon economy while working in the framework of the system of environmental economic accounting. I'm also looking forward to the panel discussion that will close this event and focus on the role of national statistics offices in the new data gap initiative, in particular on the climate change related recommendation. I encourage all participants to actively contribute to today's session. And let now turn the floor back to Bert Cross, who is the chair of the UN Committee of Experts in Environmental Economic Accounting and Deputy Director General and Chief Information Officer of the Statistics of Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you, Louis Marc. Um, I also want to welcome you all to this event jointly organized between the Statistics Department of the IMF and the UNCIA, the committee responsible for the system of environmental economic accounts. And meetings like this are important. Um, we statisticians are very good at making statistical standards. And using these standards ensures that data are well-defined, comparable over time uh, and between countries. And for example, in the area of the system of uh, national accounts, in the economic area, the system of national accounts is well known. Applying the standards ensures that the concept like GDP uh, is well defined and means the same all over the world. And as a consequence, GDP is very useful in planning processes by our policymakers and international organizations. The drawback of GDP is obviously that it only covers economic activities, while many policies not only impact the economy, but also society at large and the environment. 
The corona epidemic has shown this clearly. Therefore, it's important that also well-defined data is available for the environment and the relation between the economy and the environment. And this is where the system of environmental economic accounts come in. The first part of that system, the Central Framework, has been adopted in 2013. Um, and the second part, the ecosystem accounts, have been adopted last year. Using this here ensures that the resulting tables on the relation between the economy and the environment are well-defined and comparable over countries. So we statisticians are good at making standards and have developed them in a number of relevant domains. But of course, we need to cooperate very closely with policymakers to find out what data are really relevant for their decision processes. So decisions cannot do that alone. Finding the right indicators and the right data sets requires cooperation between statisticians and policymakers. Getting the data foundations right is teamwork. Uh, we need to do that together. And that's why today's event is important. How can we as a statistical community assist in this incredibly important domain called climate change, this tectonic shift Greg was talking about? We have a lot to offer by means of our statistical expertise and standards like the CIA and the Data Gaps Initiative um, can be very uh, useful in getting that uh, into the planning processes. So many G20 countries have already made good process in producing climate change data using the CIA, including all European Union countries, but also Australia, Brazil, Canada, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa. And several non-G20 countries in all regions of the world are also already compiling air emission and energy accounts. And we expect to see a substantial spillover effect from the DGI as the topic of today's event. We expect that the DGI initiative will also allow countries to compile some of the CIA-based indicators in the global sets of climate change statistics and indicators being put forth to the Commission by the expert group on environmental statistics this year. So the UNCIA stands ready to assist G20 countries in closing climate change data gaps through both expertise and the development of global databases for air emissions and energy. So with this, I wish us all a very fruitful event and a hand over back to Greg. Thank you very much, uh, Bert and, and Louis Mark, uh, for doing a great job in, in, in uh, sort of setting the stage. Uh, maybe now uh, we can now turn to uh, uh, sort of digging a little deeper into uh, kind of this new data gaps initiative and what it means. And uh, if I can uh, turn to Gabriel Quiros, Deputy Director of the Statistics Division for the IMF, uh, to uh, start us off with a presentation on, on uh, the pillars for the new data gaps initiative. Gabrielle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me? I have some troubles before. We can hear you. We can hear and see you. Okay. Uh, let me try to start. I think uh, there is a. I need to. I need to re-enter because I think I have a problem. Okay, so maybe as we wait for uh, Gabrielle to come back online, uh, if we can uh, maybe move on to kind of the second presentation on the agenda uh, with Echi uh, Ter Tassira. Uh, if, if you from uh, Statistics Indonesia, maybe if we can kick off with your presentation as we wait for Gabrielle to uh, come online. Thank you, Greg. So we are happy to uh, fill the time. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, IMF and uh, UN Statistic uh, Division, for giving me the chance to uh, explore about the data indicator. To, uh, to monitor the transition to a low carbon resilient economy in Indonesia. My name is Echita Sriya. I'm from Statistic Indonesia, uh, heavily uh, working in environmental account uh, division. Uh, the first slide I would like to share you about our uh, national medium term development plan 2020 and 2000, uh, until 2024. This is uh, uh, launched by uh, the president uh, in Indonesia after he elected in the general election in 2020. Uh, the main uh, driver for this 
medium term development plan is uh, the depletion of natural resources and environmental uh, degradation, high level of exposure and vulnerability to disaster in the country, and uh, a reduction of greenhouse gas and uh, greenhouse gas emission intensity. So these three uh, main driver uh, lead uh, the government to launch the low carbon development plan. Uh, low carbon development plan is a forward looking economic development uh, that include low emission and uh, climate resilient economic growth. For the uh, G20 new data gap initiative uh, in the draft work plan, as uh, mentioned by uh, uh, speaker from IMF, there are uh, 14 recommendations and seven of them are in the, in the theme of climate change. We in uh, BPS Statistic Indonesia will uh, be committed to, uh, to submit uh, six of these uh, 14 recommendations Two of them is in uh, the area of climate change, which is a greenhouse gas emission account and energy account. So uh, we uh, committed to uh, submit the initiative on climate change because we have uh, several program in uh, BPS Statistic Indonesia. Uh, to compile environmental economic accounting based on uh, SEA system of environmental economic accounting. We have done some studies. Uh, two of them are the compilation of energy flows account and air emission account, which have uh, began in uh, 2019 with the system from uh, UNSD. At the time, uh, under the development of account uh, under the SEA central framework. The milestone for uh, this uh, to fulfill the data gap initiative uh, or DGI, we uh, we began in 2022 uh, this year by construction construction and piloting of data collection template. There are uh, not yet available template that uh, provided by the G20 or the IMF. But uh, we will uh, try to, to come up with uh, our own template and then uh, uh, propose this template to the uh, DGI uh, uh, work plan. In 2023, uh, we will conduct initial data collection uh, with, uh, uh, by involving uh, several uh, line ministries that uh, related to this uh, area in climate change. And in mid 2024, uh, hopefully we can uh, submit the data and disseminate the result to the G20 submission new data uh, gaps initiative. So the progress so far in implementing uh, the uh, air emission and uh, energy account in Indonesia. We uh, regularly publish the system of environmental accounting, uh, or we call it the Cisnerling. In addition to Cisnerling, we uh, conduct several uh, in-depth study. Uh, one of them is the flows account publication. We have done a three years uh, annual publication for this uh, kind of statistic. Uh, Interagency coordinating uh, mechanism is uh, based on uh, government regulation number, number 46 in 2017. Uh, we must uh, collaborate with all the line ministry that uh, provide us with, with uh, sectoral data or basic data. And then the Statistic Indonesia will convert this uh, basic data or sectoral data into physical account based on uh, SEA framework. And then uh, to man monetize the account, we also uh, have a synergy collaboration with Ministry of uh, Finance. So the uh, right hand side of the slide uh, depict the energy intensity, renewable energy share in uh, Terra uh, uh, Joule and CO2 emission intensity uh, by uh, billion rupiah GDP in Indonesia. Evaluation and the way forward, uh, Indonesia has a target of 23, uh, sorry, 
23 a share of uh, renewable energy in the national energy mix by 2025. The policy combined with Indonesia commitment to reduce uh, emission uh, by 26% uh, by 20, uh, 2030. Uh, the BPS is committed uh, to provide data and statistics to support those policy, especially in climate change. Uh, by compiling energy account, air emission account, and carbon footprints. But we, uh, we urge the international uh, agency to have a clear methodology and uh, basic template or standard template for data submission because every country have a, a different uh, infrastructure, infrastructure in uh, statistic capability. So we need to assure uh, uh, the methodology and uh, template are standard to uh, to ensure international comparability. And the last one, intergovernmental and international program is a way uh, forward to expedite the global data set on climate change. I thank you again for this opportunity and uh, I will give the floor back to the uh, chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fascinating presentation on kind of the implementation of, of SIA to, to kind of meet these emerging needs. Um, I, I think that uh, Gabrielle is back online. Uh, so Gabrielle, maybe if I can uh, turn the floor to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I hope that uh, now it works. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, uh, to thank the organizers in particular Alessandra and my colleagues uh, Ginger Break for the details of this uh, good organization. Um, I am going to uh, share with you uh, the, um, the uh, uh, I'm going to go a step back from the uh, presentation from the Indonesia and to give you a little bit the background, the coordinates of the new DGI, uh, the logic and uh, basically uh, the motivations and uh, some elements in terms of the process, the timeline, and, uh, and uh, uh, the four groups that uh, we, uh, have, we are trying to develop in the new DEI. Um, basically, um, the, new, uh, the new DEI, uh, the TAGAP initiative, uh, which is actually addressed to the G20 countries and on a voluntary basis to the non-G20 financial stability board uh, economies, has been um, thought and uh, has been um, discussed along the lines of specific uh, principles, guiding principles that are reflected in uh, 14 recommendations that uh, are uh, the uh, current uh, draft of the world plan. The discussion is ongoing, and I will also refer finally to some of the next steps. What are the uh, guiding principles for this, this new data gap initiative? Well, uh, I'm sure that you remember that uh, the data gap initiative that we closed in December, uh, the DGI2, actually was triggered by the uh, great uh, financial crisis of uh, 2008-09. This new DGI has a different policy focus and different policy needs. As the previous one is policy oriented, definitively we really want to tackle those uh, data developments, the statistical development that are going to serve the policy makers. We address, we focus on relevant data gaps for policy purpose, but we took the emphasis on gaps more than, incre than, than on incremental, uh, incremental evolution of existing statistics. We also take uh, a short time frame. Typically, long list times in statistics are needed. Here, we give, given that the policy needs have a sense of urgency, including climate change, we need to give a res an urgent response from the statistical perspective. And the time frame or the timeline is up to five years. We are conscious that this is very ambitious and therefore we think about experimental indicators rather than finally after the five years to have already the stamp of official statistics. We also have given that some of these issues including climate change are of uh, um, are, uh, kind of uh, uh, cross, uh, uh, cross domains, including social or demographic uh, um, 
uh, statistical needs. However, we take more a narrow perspective, the economic and financial statistics, the, the economic and financial data gaps related to climate change. We don't go in dimensions which are better tackled probably by other groups. And we try not to overlap with other work stream. There is a lot of work in SEAC, as uh, has been already been said, uh, and we are depending on SEAC in many of, uh, of the developments of the indicators on climate in the new DGI, but we don't want to overlap. We don't want to repeat uh, what is the work. That would be not efficient. And then we formulate for each recommendation a specific targets, a specific targets in general, but also thinking of both the different economic and financial uh, structures and policy needs of the countries that we are addressing, as well as the different statistical capacity. We also speak about second best targets, second, second best options. Basically, there are four domains. The four domains are climate change, the, which is the topic of uh, today's session, but also let's not forget that uh, uh, in, uh, under the guidance of the Italian president, G20 and Italian presidency, and uh, um, also uh, confirmed by the Indonesia G20 presidency, we are talking in this uh, new DGI work plan, uh, two indicators on household distributional information, three indicators on uh, new financial technology services and the way this uh, new financial uh, uh, technological services um, give uh, uh, the possibility of uh, having a better financial inclusion. And the fourth area is more, is not necessarily a policy need as such, but if, if the statisticians are going to address the policy needs, they needs, the statistical producers needs to have access to private data, to administrative data, and to have a better institutional framework, and sometimes even legal framework in order to share data. So uh, with, these are the three domains that are uh, covered in the new DEI beyond the climate change. On climate change, as uh, we are hearing already and uh, has already mentioned, obviously recommendation one is greenhouse gas emissions accounts and national carbon footprints. The second one is energy accounts. The third recommendation is carbon footprints and foreign direct investment. We try here to, uh, uh, to connect, uh, uh, to uh, look at the dimension of cross-border flows uh, and the role of multinational in the way that they organize their production and therefore their carbon, free, uh, carbon, uh, carbon footprint across countries in the world. The fourth recommendation has to be more on the financial needs, and this is, uh, uh, we call it uh, green debt and equity financing. The uh, uh, recommendation five that uh, uh, I'm sure that Robert Kirchner will be alluding is physical and transition risk indicators. Uh, recommendation six is uh, on uh, the uh, on the uh, data gaps, which is particularly relevant for fiscal policies, which is uh, the impact of uh, climate of subsidies uh, on energy on climate change. And uh, finally, uh, the uh, seventh one is thinking ahead and forward looking again uh, beyond the physical and transition risk. We have to think about. Well, if this road, if those risks exist, what are the uh, policy, uh, the fiscal policy, and the current and capital expenditures that the governments and the private sector can do in this respect? So uh, the government, uh, these uh, these recommendations have a governance, and the IMF, as uh, has been mentioned uh, before by Louis Mac, is the coordinators of this new DEI in close cooperation with the interagency group. Uh, uh, on economic and financial statistics uh, members and the financial stability board. And each of these international organizations has a role in certain, uh, a special role, uh, I would say, uh, in is a collegial effort, but uh, each organization has a specific role, a leading role in some specific recommendations 
taking into account uh, their own uh, work and their own already um, uh, advanced uh, research and advanced statistics in uh, the respective fields. Anyway, it's a cooperative work. Uh, it's a cooperative work, but here you have the uh, governance with under lead agencies and contributors across, as I mentioned, the members of the IAG. Um, the, uh, finally, uh, the last part of this presentation quickly on to, basically we launched this and this uh, initiative basically in uh, more than one year ago, so, uh, sort of in January, uh, January 21 with uh, the uh, global conference on the G20 when we were still discussing how to close the TGI2, we already look and uh, uh, Propose uh, in close cooperation with the Italian G20 presidency the four main areas, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, subsequently to that uh, global conference, uh, the IMF prepared a concept note that was uh, sent to the G20 in close cooperation with other organizations. We have been in, in interaction in November, uh, January, and um, in in, in uh, November, December, January, and February, we are in close cooperation with the G20 compilers, and we are giving and taking on board their feedback. Uh, there has been a general, and I would say overwhelming, uh, general support to the uh, recommendation to the work plan. However, of course, the feedback has, uh, has been that is quite ambitious. And in, this, in the light of this feedback, in, uh, at the beginning of February, we revised the, the, uh, the work plan and relaxed some of the targets, and in particular, the second best targets in order to give more possibilities for all the countries in the G20 to achieve, to achieve in five years time, most of the data needed as we understand them under the 14 recommendations. Um, the, uh, obviously, we also want that this uh, uh, new DGI also serves the uh, purpose of the uh, uh, ongoing uh, review of international statistical standard, in particular SNA and BP, when it comes in particular to sustain and to sustainability and other related issues. The final steps, and this is my last slide, uh, we have now, today is actually uh, 23rd of February, is the last day. Uh, for the G20 uh, countries uh, to give us comments on the revised work plan, on the revised, and we have received some comments already. We are also consulting uh, specific uh, 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 working groups, uses in the G20, guided by the Indonesia presidency that have advised us to look into, to contact certain uh, working groups of uses in the G20. We are in this process. Today is also the deadline for comments for these working groups. And we hope that at the end of this month, beginning of this uh, next month, we will finalize the work plan and we'll be able to send it for uh, circulation to the uh, G20 Indonesia presidency. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much uh, for uh, sort of summarizing this, 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 this really important work. Um, and it's 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 all complementary, right? Uh, the, the, you know, for years we've been working on SIA. Um, it's complementary to the Climate Change Indicator Initiative uh, as, as, as well. So it, this all of this is, is is sort of coming together neatly, and it it, it really neatly contextualizes the presentation that we saw from uh, uh, Statistics Indonesia. Uh, maybe if I can turn to the third presenter now, uh, Robert Kirchner, uh, who is Deputy Director General of Statistics for Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, Robert, the, the, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. And I would be very happy if the slides are shared. So thanks a lot for doing that. And also for the possibility of sharing with you some considerations um, on the need of forward looking climate related data. And here I benefited very much from the advice of my colleagues, Elena Friedskohn and Mauricia in the Bundesbank. So next slide, please. So um, my presentation is divided into four parts. First of all, I would like to give an overview of international activities um, on sustainable finance data. And then we will try to motivate why we need forward-looking data. 
Certainly, we will describe some very preliminary results uh, from a joint work of colleagues in the Bundesbank and the IMF on constructing forward-looking climate-related physical risk indicators. And last but not least, as usual, let us close with some conclusions. On the next slide, I will intend to give this very short overview of international activities on sustainable finance data. And there were a number of initiatives um, on the way. Let me just mention uh, the network of green the financial system work on bridging data gaps. Um, as Gabriel and the others have pointed out, as G20 new data gaps initiative. In Europe, we have also ongoing work in the European system of central banks and the European Committee of Monetary Financial and Balanced Payments that is also does some work. So there is a multiplicity of uh, stakeholders involved in these efforts, uh, efforts. So we have central banks, statistical offices, environmental agencies, and others also vendor data, open sources, etc. play a role. I would like to say, with um, regard to central banks, their recent data initiatives focus mainly on climate change and its financial stability implication. But let's have a look on the next slide and motivate why we need forward-looking data. And I will do that simply by quoting um, selected sources of the literature. The first source I would like to put our attention to is the network on greening the financial system, which is a global network of central banks and supervisory authorities. Um, currently, the NGFS consists of 108 members and 17 observers, and they published a report on bridging data gaps in May um, last year, and that covers the data needs for various stakeholders, in particular asset managers, credit institutions, and others. Um, so this report um, of all these institutions comes to the conclusion that reliable and comparable climate-related data are critical for all these stakeholders. However, persistent gaps in climate-related data hinder the achievement of these objectives. And stakeholders report the need for more forward-looking data, for example, targets or emission pathways and granular data, for example, graphical data at entity and at asset level. Another source is mentioned on the next slide, and here I will refer to the Irving Fisher Committee on Central Bank Statistics, which has conducted a survey among its members. And for the time being, there were, I think, 96 full institutional members, mainly central banks. And the survey received answers um, from 63 organizations. So of key importance for central banks are indicators to properly support progress asset management, in particular, on sustainable finance instruments as well as environmental indicators related to physical risks. However, as many indicators for the time being are backward looking, it is useful, so that's one of the results of this survey, to complement them with forward looking data to track commitments towards a greener economy. On the next slide, we see that also in Europe that work is going on in the European system of central banks and they developed a roadmap of climate change related indicators, mainly as an outcome of its monetary policy and strategy review. I will not go to the details due to time constraints, but we see that it is a step by step approach. So the first conclusion that we take from, take from these few slides is I would like to say that forward looking climate related data are important for many stakeholders. So let me now share with you some first findings on the way to construct forward-looking um, climate-related physical risk indicators. And here we benefit a little bit that the Bundesbank acquired a variety of climate-related indicators from data providers, mainly two data providers, um, which are now available for internal analysis. So both data sets contain data for scenarios um, for different levels of global warming, a low level, a medium, and a high level. And my colleagues, Moritz Fehr and Alan Matrizkorn, together with Jens Meerhoff, are now investigating the question, how can we use existing climate data from private data providers to extract relevant forward-looking aggregates at sector and or country level? On the next slide, um, we start by comparing constructing forward-looking climate-related risk indicators um, based on company group level data. And here we have two different sources. 
On the left-hand side, we see um, the medium global warming scenario, and on the right-hand side, um, the, um, the global warming scenario. One back, please. And still try to describe this slide. Yes. On the x-axis, we see a provider, um, provider A and the risk of this enterprise, and for provider B, that is um, mentioned on the y-axis. Each individual point is an enterprise group. So what we immediately see is that quality issues arise. So source A can assign a low risk to an enterprise group, and source B can assign a high risk to the same enterprise group. And robustness check of results based on the data from different data providers are needed for drawing reliable conclusion with regard to forward-looking climate-related risks, but I think that's relatively typical. On the next slide, we see that we cannot expect miracles from available data sources. Often, we do not have um, enough issuers for meaningful aggregates if we look into the sources and have a breakdown by countries or a breakdown um, by NACE classification. But we also see that there are some promising results, uh, perhaps possible to available, from for the US, China, Japan, India, and the European Union, in particular for the manufacturing sector, and that may could be a contribution um, to recommendation five, which was mentioned uh, by Gabriel on physical and transitional risk indicators for the new data gaps initiative. On the next slide, we'll have a look um, on the way forward. So I think central banks could be a good place to construct physical risk indicators by combining climate-related um, data with financial data, which is mainly available um, in central banks. And in the short to medium term, making use of existing enterprise-level data from private sources, combining them with public data and official statistics, that is perhaps the way how to bridge data gaps for the time being. And in the longer term, if we want to be more precise on detailed physical risks and their financial implications, I think we need also new skills and uh, the relevant granular financial data. So let me conclude with two slides. So I think what we have seen so far was on the next slide, yes, exactly, um, that given the growing importance of climate-related data for policymaking, quality of the data is a key issue. Fulfilling the fundamental principles of official statistics give, I think, good guidance. We need a statistical framework covering statistical principles, concrete steps, also taking into account the foreseen disclosure initiatives and taxonomies um, in order to prepare a sound and sufficient detailed climate-related data to support policy making. In the last slide, I think, what are the concrete steps? Dashboards are already available to improve the availability of macro-level um, climate-related data, such as um, offered by the IMF, NGFS, and also the Deutsche Bundesbank. With a few of microdata needs, I think here some work is going on, and very useful work um, about data catalogs and data sources, such as the Network of Reading the Financial System repository, with an internationally harmonized structure contribute to facilitate access to climate-related data, which is needed by many purposes. So all in all, we are looking forward to the follow-up of the G20 Data Gaps Initiative and concrete steps associated with this effort. But we also think that we have to think about, in particular, enhancing the scope on microdata for markets, banking, supervision, financial stability, economics, and research to take all the needs into account. Thanks a lot for your for listening. Thank you very much, Robert. It's it's always useful to kind of draw that link between kind of the statistical world and kind of the, the real kind of central bank world in order to ensure that, uh, you know, work we do is, is kind of aligned with what users actually need. Um, we do have a bit of time in the agenda for, for questions uh, for, for our presenters. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to raise a hand or, or uh, put a question in the chat. While we're waiting for people to collect their thoughts, maybe I can I can I can I can throw out a question. And and this is uh, maybe Robert. This is this is to you. I find your presentation really kind of intriguing, right? Because you know you're talking about kind of the application of, of the work that we uh, that we're going to do with with sort of DGI three. But uh, you know you're drawing the link to uh, the importance of uh, more micro level analysis, more more kind of micro data, and I'm, from your perspective, uh, maybe this is unfair because you're a central bank. 
but, uh, you know, insofar as ultimately, uh, you know, ultimately the behavior firms, right, need to be nudged in order to kind of move towards uh, kind of more sustainable practices. And, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the data that would come from uh, sort of DGI3, uh, do you see that solely as kind of a monitoring mechanism for, for the bank or, or uh, you know, are there positive externalities that we can get as we, as we either try to improve data that are available from private sector sources or else, you know, even nudge businesses towards uh, sort of changing the behavior? Um, directly to answer your question, I think there is much going on in, in the world, in statistics as well outside in, in, in statistics. So uh, what we hope to get, and therefore uh, perhaps getting a better overview on, on, on many things that um, are on the way, um, disclosure initiatives, which are in particular on the European level um, under discussion. So we have um, the CSRD, is the um, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, together with certain taxonomies, to bring in relevant data on an entity level of enterprises, on their on relevant information on climate change and the implications for these enterprises, jointly together with financial statements. And as this is then also disclosed, that means publicly available, I would like to say that's a very useful tool in particular for central banks and a possibility for linking the idea of what are the economic implications and what shall be done and, and the prices to pay um, on the pathways forward with regard to global warming. We also have initiatives on the way to combine perhaps um, data sources which are used um, in official statistics for environmental statistics and also perhaps to, to bring it also in combination with those initiatives which are going on in the financial sphere. And here I mentioned the work of the European Community on Monetary Financial and Balance of Payment Statistics, which looked carefully in, in, in the individual sources to bring it together in one direction that we can all benefit uh, from these things. And I would like to say that's the way forward. And also then this joint endeavor, official statistical work, private data sources, disclosed data, the new G20 data gaps initiative, um, other work which is going on. And I would like to say that all would be needed for fulfilling the gaps and the requirements of users. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't see any questions in the chat and I uh, see no hands raised. Um, so maybe then if we can uh, turn to our, our panel discussion, um, uh, the our moderator for this discussion is uh, Gabriel. So if I can uh, turn the floor back to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Greg. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Chair, for uh, now moving us to the panel. Uh, let me first of all uh, introduce uh, the panelists. We have, uh, um, I think, a very good panel. Um, Three colleagues, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our uh, panelists from the South Africa. Uh, Joy De Bear is a Deputy Director General of uh, South Africa Statistics. Uh, and um, then uh, we have from uh, uh, Italy, from Banca Italia, Alfonso Rosalia, who has been uh, an active. Um, an active uh, member of the Italian presidency in the, in the formulation of uh, the main direction during last year on the new data, uh, data guide initiative. And uh, we have outside the G20, uh, we have outside the G20 uh, representing a non-G20 country, uh, Mele Bilsma uh, from the Central Bank of the Netherlands who has been an active participant in the uh, DGI in the last, uh, in the DGI 2 and uh, uh, in the last years, and also involved in the discussion of the current, uh, of the current uh, uh, work plan for the new DGI. So I'm not sure whether uh, Joy is uh, online. I see, uh, yes, I see now Joy, uh, they were out there. So, um, very good. Uh, so we are going to, uh, I am going to ask uh, uh, some questions uh, to 
uh, two questions to each of the panelists uh, in two rounds. I am going to start, if that's fine with you, with uh, Alfonso uh, Rosalia uh, from Banca d'Italia, because my first question is uh, rather a little bit the background of the current uh, new DGI, uh, certainly on climate, but also on other, uh, other uh, areas of data gaps. So I would like to ask you, Alfonso, uh, from the perspective of, uh, of a central bank, uh, what are you thinking, what are you, uh, why in a way you as part of the Italian presidency propose these four main uh, areas for data gaps and the focus of the new DGI? So what are in your view and why are those data gaps so relevant for policy making? You have to unmute uh, Alfonso. Apologies, so can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Okay, great, thank you very much. So I was just thanking uh, the organizers and uh, for, for the invitation and for uh, arranging this very interesting uh, event, which I guess uh, gives a very uh, broad um, overview of what's going on uh, in these things. So getting to your question, Gabriel, I think, well, the, I mean, there are four areas as, as you highlighted. The first one is, you know, climate change and the statistical and informational needs that we have to address to uh, fill in relevant gaps with the focus on the economic and financial sectors. As you said, there are many initiatives going around uh, in the world across uh, agencies that address from several angles this, uh, you know, the climate change uh, issue and the information we need to tackle it properly in terms of designing policies and uh, actually learning what's going on. Um, we in the DGI, as you said, we are focusing on the economic and financial uh, aspects of this uh, uh, big trend. And we recognize the number of uh, uh, relevant data gaps. I guess the presentation that Robert gave uh, was very, very clear in what are the major gaps for a central bank in, uh, you know, when, when, they, when they want to think about, you know, what, we, what are the implications for a central bank of, of, uh, of climate change. I guess it's, it's, it's interesting, I mean, it's useful to remind what a central bank does. A central bank addresses primarily price stability and stabilizes the economic cycle. It's not really directly involved into designing policies or transition policies, fiscal policies. That's basically almost throughout the world. However, within their mandate, they can do a lot of things and uh, they need information. And part of the information that we need is what Robert actually uh, highlighted. We need to know how climate risks and you know, the exposure to transition uh, um, interact with the financial sector in terms of funding or lending of banks, funding of firms. Um, and this is a very daunting and demanding task. So we actually felt the need for you know, a coordinated initiative that has a strong political endorsement as the DGI to address these kind of data gaps. So I guess the first set of recommendations regarding statistical needs on climate change is pretty uh, straightforward. It's uh, uh, an existential threat and we all have to do something and central banks within their mandate can do something provided they have the relevant information. There are other three areas which you highlighted, which the, the Bank of the Italian Presidency felt relevant. One is the household distributional accounts, which maybe it's useful to, to share with others, is basically continuing work that was already done uh, in, the, in the previous initiatives. At the time, it was stimulated by you know, the, 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 the consequences of the global financial crisis. So we wanted to know how households had been exposed to the global financial crisis, how you know, financial developments would affect households and how household heterogeneity, so the fact that some households are richer than others, can actually affect the, the working of the broad economy. So in terms of policy, monetary policy, which is relevant for a central bank, but also more broadly the productive activity, which may be relevant for governments in designing fiscal or you know, um, um, stimulation policies. Uh, it is, I think, very, very relevant also in the context of climate change. Climate change will have major distributional uh, consequences. And so we have to push forward you know, the frontier of the knowledge we have accumulated over time in terms of household distribution to be ready to understand, assess, and actually forecast once we have you know, uh, forward-looking indicators, uh, what you know, climate change could imply for, for distribution. And then we have like the third um, recommendation, which is fintech. Fintech is a very you know big trend in terms of innovation in the financial sector. And so, as a central bank, we are of course you know interested in monitoring. And there are a lot of interactions with you know distribution accounts, for example. The introduction of new technologies into the financial sector allows you know a 
previously um, um, uh, how, I mean, households and individuals that were outside the financial market to enter the financial market. So to benefit from you know, this sharing, uh, lending, borrowing, um, and this also has distributional consequences. And so this is something that has to be addressed. I guess the most, I mean, not the most important, but a very relevant uh, uh, set of recommendations in the new DGI, and this is something we really uh, worked hard on, is the fourth set of recommendations, which you mentioned, Gabriel, which is the set of recommendations, a couple of recommendations that actually address the fact that we need, as policymakers and as statistical agencies, we need the possibility to uh, tap into data sources uh, as they become relevant because we are facing specific circumstances. It was clearly with the pandemic. The pandemic was something that nobody would ever uh, have thought would happen, no, at the global, such a large global scale. But it happened. And we actually, as central banks, but also governments, were actually in, in, a, in very dire straits because we didn't really have the information to tackle quickly such an emergency from you know, our own perspective. So monetary policy, fiscal policy, and the like. Uh, so we had to come up with ways to measure what was happening on the ground and we had to tap into very very new sources going forward the exposure to unprecedented circumstances because of climate change because of other things is likely to be major and so we need to set up a framework protocols that allow policymakers and statistical agencies to tap into available sources to build the information that is required to design policy in a timely and effective way so, and we have to be ready to do that. So I guess the fourth set of recommendations that the GI on uh, data access of, to private and administrative data is very, very relevant and cuts across all the initiatives because it really empowers um, uh, institutional agencies uh, with, the, with the possibility of, you know, getting the information they need when they need it and start working on it quickly rather than, you know, starting big programs that take time. And this is crucial when, you know, the shocks are so quick as the pandemic was the case, or you know, are likely to have really unexpected consequences as climate change is likely to be. We can only forecast some things. We cannot really forecast everything. So we have to be ready to learn what we need to know when the, 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 the case calls for it. So I guess this is basically the framework and the reasons why we really pushed for this for, uh, for things. And I'm happy to see that you know, they're being shared as you were mentioned by the international community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... Alfonso for bringing us uh, the rationale behind uh, the, um, uh, the leadership of uh, Italy in the current uh, uh, discussion and the launch of the discussion uh, that happened during the Italian presidency of the G20. Now uh, we are moving uh, to Joe, uh, Joe De Bear. Uh, Joe, we have uh, heard clearly from the angle of the policy making, uh, the importance of addressing uh, new, uh, new areas, new data gaps, or even uh, developing further some of the existing gaps like in uh, income and wealth distribution. Now focusing more on climate, uh, Joe De Bear, from uh, uh, your perspective in uh, very, I think, uh, always very interesting perspective uh, from South Africa for as an uh, important emerging economy. Um, definitely, uh, we have uh, a new uh, urgent uh, policy needs, in particular on climate change data, climate change experimental indicators, as we like to call it the AMF. In your view, uh, Joe, uh, uh, what uh, uh, the main uh, methodological and data source uh, data sources challenges that we are going to face. Obviously, in order to produce uh, a statistics, some of experimental or uh, and down the road official statistics on climate change, uh, economic and financial areas, uh, we need to develop further the methodology or actually to. Uh, uh, some many uh, a good part of this already existing, but we have to develop it uh, and to make it more focused. And we definitely have to develop new data sources. What are the main challenges from a statistics producer's perspective, Joe? After having heard uh, the policy making point of view, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for thank you for the questions and good afternoon to all the participants. I think we all agree that. Uh, to ensure that we have high quality climate change statistics um, that are fit for use um, and therefore will be official statistics, we need to have both a decent and a proved methodological framework 
as well as comprehensive source data that feeds into this framework that is robust. And in achieving that, there are a few things that uh, we need uh, to accomplish uh, from a South African perspective. And then maybe I'll share some thoughts on how we can leverage the DGI um, alongside the SIA uh, to achieve uh, these areas. So if we turn to what we think is needed is that although we are all in agreement that we need to adopt an integrated approach for reporting on the economy and the environment, what we have learned in our uh, activities is that it is crucial that we base all of these integrated accounts on the SIA because that gives us at least a comparable uh, time series of statistics that we, that we can uh, really use for policy purposes. Now, the stats office has a key role to play in the data gap initiative uh, in order to lead and coordinate all the statistical activities that relates to the climate change. We are not the policy makers of climate change, but we must lead the statistics that is used to monitor uh, the policies uh, for monitoring evaluation purposes, as an example. And in our view, the first step is for the country to really develop a natural capital accounting strategy, because this ensures that all the role players are involved in this um, thinking around the, the project and the DGI. And in the strategy, you can also ensure that you map out the future activities and prioritize the different accounts um, that are required, such as uh, accounts for carbon or climate change. And uh, once you have that, it will allow you to measure related expenditures or the cost of mitigation um, policies. Secondly, we also feel that there should be a focus on ecosystem-based adaptation uh, that is using biodiversity and ecosystem services as part of the overall adaptation strategy um, to counter the adverse effect of the climate change. And in order to do that, we need to have a better uh, understanding or at least improve our understanding on how to quantify the contribution of ecological infrastructure ecosystems um, uh, based adaptation. Another need is to uh, relates more to a broader range of carbon and greenhouse gas emission accounts, um, but they must be spatially explicit. In other words, comparable to the ecosystem accounts that we have. And all of these fit as different elements of the NCA strategy um, in a, to provide us a coherent picture of all of these interactions between the economy and the environment. And therefore, it's important for tracking and reporting on the progress of the SDGs and target uh, that are set within the, the policies. Turning to the leverage of uh, CR through the DGI, um, we aim to close our climate change data gaps by implementing this strategy. And when we developed the strategy, we structured it in such a way that there are specific goals and strategic initiatives within the strategy that each have specific outputs and activities. And then we group them based on a low road approach which means this is what we will be able to achieve with existing resources and also a high road approach where it is sort of more of the wish list or the blue sky thinking of what is it that you would want to achieve if you had an injection of uh, support from uh, either the national treasury or from uh, donor institutions or international bodies. And once you have that, you can really start mapping out what's going to have next, uh, what's going to happen next. So our implementation plan currently lists uh, three high-level activities and accounts that relates to carbon and greenhouse emissions. Uh, the first of these is that we aim to compile biannual greenhouse gas emissions and inventory reports. Uh, the second is to produce spatially explicit accounts of carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this will also include a feasibility study of what type of accounts and the re resolution thereof is most relevant uh, to carbon taxes and training, trading. And if we manage to get onto the high road, uh, there's a third activity that we've identified, which will then be to regularly produce selected accounts of carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but as I mentioned, this is dependent on the high road uh, coming to fruit. Um, let me conclude by saying that uh, in order to achieve these outputs, even if it is only these three that we have explicit in our strategy, you really need the cooperation of all the role players. Even if the NSO takes the lead, the NSO doesn't have the, um, the know-how and the knowledge of all these environmental data sets and how they stick together. So we can lead and coordinate, but you cannot do it without the experts from the scientific fields or the policy department. 
and you will only get the buy-in of those colleagues if they were involved with the development of the initial NCA strategy. So that brings us back to the opening remarks that for the country to start off with a strategy, make sure you get everybody on board at that stage so that they walk this road with you. Don't try to involve them at the end of the, of the project when you want to start putting the numbers together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Joe, for this uh, very clear perspective from the statistical uh, producer's uh, point of view on the challenges, both on the methodology and the data sources. Let's go now back to policy. Uh, and uh, in that, I would like now to invite uh, Mele uh, Bilsma to uh, take us uh, to uh, a little bit more uh, on, the, again, uh, specific if possible on public policies related to climate. Obviously, uh, climate change is there, and public uh, policies are called basically for to act in two dimensions. One, in mitigating the effects, the ongoing effects already, what is going on uh, for the society, um, for the economy, uh, for the financial system, uh, more uh, specifically as well. And uh, so on one hand, uh, uh, the public policies are called to mitigate the uh, adverse effects uh, of climate change. On the other hand, the public policies are asked and tasked to uh, facilitate the transition, the adaptation uh, to a greener economy or uh, at least a less, uh, uh, a less um, um, a damaging type of economy, if we uh, say it uh, very, uh, very bluntly. So, Mele, the question to you: uh, uh, There is this discussion; these policies are there. I think, uh, to a certain extent, are being formulated. To another extent, uh, they are not yet formulated because it's a still work in, pro in progress. Even the definition of those uh, policies uh, in the different areas. Uh, fiscal, monetary, and so on and so forth. In your perspective, as an observer and as a member of uh, a policy-making institution, what do you think, uh, uh, if you can share your view on what are some of these uh, policies uh, in terms of mitigation and adaptation, and more specifically, uh, to the extent that uh, the policymakers have already defined those policies, what are, in your view, the data gaps? Uh, and to which extent uh, the data gaps that we have identified in the uh, seven recommendations on climate change for the new DEI, do you think are serving well, or we should, uh, we should still uh, revisit it? So thank you so much, Gabriel, and uh, th also thanks to the organizers for having me here today on the on the panel. Now, when answering this question, I'm also going to take the perspective of someone who has been previous, previously involved in the DGI and who was also lucky enough to be able to represent both the central bank and the national statistics office. So I had kind of a dual role, which I think is always a very nice perspective to also look at uh, the playing field. Now, if you look at policies, then um, uh, uh, policies, it, it's a national framework uh, to a large extent, sometimes a regional framework. So the kind of policies that are implemented to help uh, migrate towards a, a system which is more sustainable and less susceptible to climate change. Um, there are a few common denominators that pop up in a lot of places, such as cap and trade schemes, obviously, carbon taxes. Um, there's a huge transition issue involved in uh, who bears the transition costs and then how do you make sure that, that these people and companies can bear the transition costs in the form of subsidies, for instance. Um, there's the issue of industrial standards, the setting, for instance, ever more tighter industrial standards on the emission standards for air conditioners, cars, etc. So, but it, that's basically a national choice. And, from the statistical perspective, I think um, the, the question surrounding each policy is rather constant, which is that policymakers and also society will always look to us for impartial data to be able to make proper policy decisions uh, and also provide facts that help steer policy once you put it in, in motion. And here, obviously, what Robert said about the forward-looking component is very relevant, where um, we obviously don't have a full-functioning framework that uh, that gives instruments to policymakers to, to keep like a proper monitoring and forward-looking view on a broad set of climate uh, policies. So um, 
that's the one hand of that's one part of the story. The other part is there is a lot of base of stuff still, still already there. You know, um, we we do have frameworks which provide a good basis. The CI is obviously one. It's established. It provides a lot of information on the nexus between the environment and the economy, and it, in the basis obviously is really uh, really useful. Um, and obviously there are the the the, more, the, the, the 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 balance of payments. There's the FDI statistics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think a crucial thing in meeting the demand for good data to be able to allow policymakers to make the right choices is uh, combining and finding synergies between the sets. And I think this is also an experience I take away from the DGI uh, tool in which I was involved, where each framework has its own strength, but it only comes into full fruition if you combine them and you seek out synergies. And it turns out there always are synergies because there's for instance, in the in the DGI two, one of the things which I found was happy to reflect on is that if you combine sectoral accounts, which was an important part of the work, with balance of payments, it opens up new methods of measuring the economy, measuring vulnerabilities, and it was also really sought after by by users. So we, we were able to combine data sets to great effect. And I have I have the, the the feeling, given the current work plan, that the new DGI it will be no different. Uh, for instance, taking the SIA, which is a very important framework, um, it, 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 it provides a lot of information on this economic environmental nexus. Um, but then if you, for instance, complement it with FDI and Bob statistics, th that provide by its very nature a lot of information on the international financial transactions, uh, which is crucial if you want to get a, a good grip on, uh, for instance, the externalities internationally you know the difference between the production view of a carbon footprint, the consumption food view of a carbon footprint. It's really hard to just do that on a national level. So you need this puzzle piece of the BOP and the FDI to properly track where are carbon emissions coming from, where are they going, and how does that add up in the end on a national uh, on a national uh, level. So um, this is just one example. And then obviously in, in this particular, in the DGI3, there's also um, a prominent role for private data sources. I'll get back to that later as, as an ex extra type of source. Now, obviously this means that uh, uh, seeking out national synergy is always really useful. And I think almost every speaker that spoke before me alluded to that. I think that's the, that's the right thing to do. Um, I can say that from my own perspective, we, we benefited greatly from the increased cooperation between NSO and, and National Central Bank uh, to complete our DGI2 recommendations. Where there is kind of a fundamental distinction, perhaps it's more in my head than anything, but I'll just share it. I think that there's a difference between looking at the subject matter and then seeking if there are parts where you need to cooperate or starting with a cooperation and then putting in the subject matter. And from my perspective, we, we tried to implement a second approach in the Netherlands, and I'm quite happy with how it turned out. And it means that you always start from the cooperation and the new initiatives fit in uh, relatively neatly. I mean, it's still, still two big organizations working together. Nothing is ever perfect, doesn't need to be, but it gives us a relatively good starting position. Now, uh, also the, 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 on the issue of private data sources, um, there's just no data gaps, there's also methodological gaps, um, obviously. And this is also quite visible in the, in the DJI work plan where for some elements, there, there is a very well thought of the methodological point. It's just that, we need to get to the implementation of it more. In other cases, we still need to figure out a little bit what the proper methodology is. And it's especially the case also when you look at private data sources where private data sources are really helpful. And I think it's right that we have a separate section in the work plan on the access to administrative data sources, which Alfonso, I think, rightly alluded to. Um, but um, data, creators of data sources are not really statisticians to the point where, where they create it to the level that we as statisticians are used to, you know, for instance, very simple things as uh, taking away structural breaks in your time series, looking at inflation, or correcting for it, making that visible, price effects, uh, sometimes it's on this very basic level that you still need to take the data up to the next level. So that's also, I think, a challenge in this perspective. Uh, and then, then finally, a particular element in the, in the new edition of the DGI uh, is, uh, I think, the speed of implementation. Uh, if I look back on the last DGI, it, it, we took 11 years to formulate what we wanted to do and then implement it. 
uh, in the current work plan, um, well, the, in the last revision, uh, Gabriel, uh, is, there's a little more leeway, but it's often between two and four years to move towards an end result. And that's even in the cases where there's still methodological work to be done before you can really start implementing. Now, is this a bad thing? Well, no, I, I think I, I'm not arguing with the urgency. So I think the, 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 the timelines are proportional to the actual challenge that we rightfully are asked uh, to, to rise up to. But organizationally, if you want to, to get stuff done, it's really a challenge you know, because we all know how it works. Once there, is a, a, once there is approval in the G20, the wheels are put in motion and we need to procure budgets. We need to reallocate people, hire people, set up teams, make ICT changes. And these are things with a fixed time period before you even get started. And I think a proper case can be made given the ambition of what is to be achieved here. Uh, some extra resources are likely to be needed. So that's also a discussion that um, some of the countries or all of the countries may need to have. So it, it, there, there, again, there's no arguing with timelines, but getting it done in time uh, will obviously be a challenge. And, I hope that if we look back at, on it in the end, we'll be able to say that, again, there's been a lot of synergy between the frameworks that we've managed to put up and put to good use. So that's, uh, that will be my concluding part of this uh, answer, Gabriel. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amele, for this very uh, comprehensive uh, uh, overview uh, that you are making. Uh, you are uh, discussing the DEI, not only, of course, from the lenses of a policymaker, but also as a, as a statistician, and certainly um, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very good that uh, you uh, enter this, uh, with this double hat. Now, going back to the hat or the approach of policy making, uh, we have now a much shorter round of uh, three questions for one for each of the panelists. I go back, but now on this occasion, I will have to ask you to be uh, more uh, to be uh, shorter because uh, we are running out of time already. Um, and I still would like to see whether we can have uh, some five minutes if there is any question from the chat. So I will ask you please to limit your intervention to two, three minutes only. So in this respect, uh, I will try to, uh, to be very specific on the questions. Uh, starting back uh, with the same order uh, with uh, the policy making uh, view of, from uh, Banca d'Italia, Alfonso. Um, we have, uh, um, uh, we have uh, discussed, uh, and certainly Robert Kirchner has uh, made uh, a fantastic presentation on physical and transition risks. Uh, so do you have any particular view to add uh, from the policy making in terms of, uh, of what is needed there? Uh, but from the with the heart of a, a, a policy policy making dealing with financial stability issues like a central bank and in particular a transition uh, physical transition risk for financial institutions what do you ask uh, uh, the statisticians to do urgently alfonso two to three minutes please yes thanks gabriel uh, so I, i'll be quick i guess robert basically said it all in the sense that we the, the information we need as a central bank but in general as a policy maker uh, is the information is what you're pointing at so we want to know how assets are exposed both to physical risk, which can be geographically related, as Joe was saying, it can be, you know, the link to the technology it is adoption, uh, adopting both uh, the transition risk, which again is related to the fact that, you know, you're located in a certain area, you produce a certain good, you use certain inputs. This is the kind of information we need. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, different users will use this information at different aggregation levels. From the central bank perspective, I guess the micro dimension is that agents, economic agents, want to know this information at their individual level to be able to price the risk of climate uh, change or of the transition related to climate change into their own decisions. But there's a macro perspective which we as policymakers must account for, which is the amplification effects of individual choices. Think of a firm, you know, which properly accounts for the risk embedded, climate change risk embedded in its decisions. The bank funding the firm also accounts because nowhere the firm will be locating the plant and everything, but there are workers in this firm. So if something happens, the firm is insured or has accounted properly it's, uh, for risk in the 
decisions, the bank as well, maybe stockholders as well, because they knew all these informations, but nobody thought of the risk and the consequences of the fact that workers bear the consequences of this risk, which may be, for example, the fact that having no income, they're not able to pay back the mortgage on their house, which is not exposed directly to climate related risk. So we as policymakers should also have this higher level of aggregation, not only the individual information, and this requires basically a, a bigger picture of how agents interact. We have a lot of data on that. I mean, also coming from the past DGIs, which have helped us to you know, clarify relationships between economic sectors and economic agents. This data must be integrated with you know, the data that Robert was um, uh, very, very efficiently um, exposing about you know, the exposure of these productive assets uh, to risk. And when I say productive assets, I misuse the word. I also intend you know, uh, laborers, which maybe you know, are only indirectly exposed to these risks. So we as policymakers need also this macro perspective, and this must be built starting from very granular data. But this is the data we are after. We should be after granular data. Even if, even if it's from private sources, we should develop the methodology, you know, uh, Melle was mentioning to understand this data and put them to use. But we have to make an effort there, I think. Thank you, I, I try to be as short as that is. Thank you, thank you so much for the clear and the concise uh, response. Uh, Appreciate it, Alfonso. I always like uh, to discuss the statistics, first asking at the users, uh, and if possible, uh, if uh, they are reachable, the policymakers about what they need in, in uh, from statistics. And I love immediately to uh, move the, uh, the floor to the statisticians. So I think this is uh, now the turn of Joe. And uh, I would like, uh, uh, Joe, uh, Joe, we are hearing that uh, a lot is expected from statistics and statistics compilers, statistics producers, also in this new DGI, uh, given uh, the ambition uh, in terms of the uh, difficulties of the definition of the targets and second best targets, as we call them in the DGI, plus as well the short, uh, relatively short timeline of up to uh, five years with uh, some, if possible, uh, first results after three years for most of the recommendations. Uh, this, of course, uh, uh, requires, I think, uh, this is then uh, the uh, uh, statisticians uh, should uh, speak typically very often, as uh, should be about resources, uh, human resources, uh, also technical resources, financial resources. But there is something, an intangible resource, I would call it, which is institutional cooperation. And these oh. institutional corporations across uh, agencies, uh, very often government agencies in the countries. And it's because of this purpose that uh, uh, I, we thought, uh, certainly I was one of them, that uh, certainly in the new DEI there should be a dedicated, uh, a dedicated recommendation, is recommendation 13, on, uh, on the... Uh, corporations uh, and to access uh, administrative data by the statistical compiler and of course uh, private data and in the new uh, in, in the new uh, in the new world uh, digital data or what is uh, has been called traditionally big data so uh, joe uh, if uh, the policymakers expect so much from you the compilers, the national compilers. What are you? What would you be asking in particular on this intangible, intangible resource, which is access to data and uh, good corporations uh, with the statistical compilers to produce what is required? Yeah, it's a very valid question. I think if you go back and you use the analogy of a carrot and a stick approach, it is clear that the stick approach does not work. The NSO cannot go to the uh, partners and say we demand the data or these classifications and methodological changes definitional you need to get people on board with the carrot approach make it clear to the users why it's important that they make their data available in the correct formats whether there's reclassification of, uh, required or whatever the case is so that everybody at least contributes towards the achievement of these data gaps and if i can learn from uh, the institutional mechanisms that we developed while we uh, we're in the drafting phase of our NCA strategy. We found that in our case, it works very well to have a three-tiered uh, approach to institutional cooperation. So sitting at the top, you would have a strategic advisory group that maybe only meets once a year, but their um, purpose is quite specific in that they uh, link activities to policy development. Uh, they give guidance on strategic uh, priorities, scheduling of accounts and that type of thing. 
One tier below that, uh, we have a coordinating unit um, where you are a little bit more practical. Um, you have partners that can add value with those discussions. And the primary objective is purely to coordinate activities, make sure there's no duplication, no gaps, or trying to think of strategies to fill the gaps that there are. And then one level lower, we would go to technical working groups where you really get the technicians involved to say, how are we going to solve these problems? How can we amend the data? Who has other data that is that is meaningful? Maybe they will have subgroups that have to meet, but in our view, that sort of institutional mechanism um, works very well for us, and uh, hopefully we can maintain this in our DGI project. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Joe, for that. Uh, last but not least, a final uh, short intervention uh, in this, uh, for this panel before we close it and uh, bring back uh, the floor to uh, the chair, uh, Greg. Um, uh, Mele, uh, with your double hat of uh, statisticians and uh, uses and policy making uh, from the, your institution, any last comments uh, on any of the two, uh, the two sides of the coin? Uh, Mele? Yes, thanks, and I'll keep it really, really brief. Well, on the statistician side, I do really uh, side. I re do really uh, uh, see a lot. It's it's really um, what Joe says. It really uh, it's the same with us. Huh? So this this three tiered system, we find it to be successful, and where you set up a governance where where there's um, a proper level for everything to avoid being stuck in technical detail too far up the chain, yeah, but also the other way around. So that this is something that uh, that I think is, is, is really good. Then also, if, if it comes to the, the type of indicators that we want, the data gaps that are there, I mean, uh, Alfonso and also Robert said a lot about that. Really briefly, in Europe, we also did in the ECB context a user consultation where we then find that having uh, the transition risks is something that merits a lot of attention, obviously. So this is one of the reasons also for the carbon footprints as a prominent mechanism. Physical risks, like uh, the risks from uh, storms, flooding, etc., and also green financial instruments. So I, I think this is also you find reflective for us, but also I think broader in the work plans. So um, yeah, uh, that's yeah. Period. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, with this, we conclude uh, our question and answers uh, for this panel. Uh, and I think uh, I should uh, uh, bring back uh, the floor to Peter, uh, to Greg, sorry. Uh, allow me, uh, Chair, just to thank again the organizers of, uh, for this event, in particular, Alessandra Alfieri and, uh, and my colleague, uh, Jim Tebrake. Uh, thank you. The floor back to you, Chair. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, and I think this takes us uh, to uh, to the end of uh, today's session. Uh, I, th I think this has been a very valuable discussion. Um, the um, uh, coming from a national statistical office, if I can sound a little bit biased, I think it's critical that the work that we do is always founded on uh, kind of the demands of users and where emerging user requirements are, are coming from. Um, I, I did uh, kind of use that metaphor of uh, tectonic shifts uh, that are occurring. And uh, as our, our friends in the natural sciences uh, rely on sort of uh, different sensors and measures to understand the uh, me measure these shifts as they're happening and the impacts of these shifts, you know, we have to do the exact same thing uh, kind of in the field of, of climate change. Uh, I, I would like to thank um, uh, kind of all of our all of our presenters today. Uh, I, I certainly walk away from this session with a clearer notion of uh, where we're going in terms of uh, you know, measures uh, that we'll have to come up with and moving through uh, sort of DGI3. Uh, but, uh, you know, with, with uh, kind of the, the, this morning's discussion with, with uh, central banks and, and folks working in policy, it's clear that uh, these measures are, are, or these metrics are, are of huge importance uh, in understanding uh, where it is that, uh, that the ball is going. Uh, so with that, I, I would like to thank uh, colleagues uh, from the IMF and uh, UNSD who played a key role in kind of organizing the session. I would like to thank uh, kind of all of the uh, all of the speakers and presenters who made time uh, today to to uh, sort of share their thoughts and views. And I would also like to thank uh, all all of the attendees uh, for taking time out of their very busy schedules to uh, to to attend this side event. Uh, and with that, uh, I, I wish you all a, a good day. Uh, Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, uh, and, and uh, wish you all well. Thank you very much. Goodbye.
Thank you. Bye-bye.